Good evening, everyone. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you all on behalf of Leicester Diocese Intercultural Worshipping Communities and Discipleship at Leicester Cathedral. My name is Miriam and I'm the Discipleship Officer at Leicester Cathedral. So welcome to the fourth webinar in our Global Voices series. This evening we are focusing on images of God. And I'd like to open the webinar with a short story about my family. It was in August 2020 when our family enjoyed a short break in France. While we were there, we visited the Basilica of Notre Dame in the little town of Liège. And there, between the beautiful and imposing depiction, depictions of Jesus, surrounded by adoring figures of cherubs, stood a rather diminutive statue of a virgin and child. The most striking thing in this scene was not the obvious difference in size, but the contrast between the black complexion of the virgin and child with the European looks of Jesus and his choir of cherubs. We had met our first black Madonna. And as I stood there in silence with my then eight year old daughter, I could see excitement in her face. I guess that maybe she could relate to this image of a mother holding up a young child, as this is what she witnessed on a daily basis when I was looking after her younger sister. But more significantly, I wonder whether what drew her in and captured her attention was the opportunity of seeing something of her own identity as a child of dual heritage being offered to her in this rural French, French church. So sitting with that depiction of the sacred to the traits of a, a black woman caused me to ponder as well. Seeing this mother gently holding a child in her arms reminded me, first of all, of my own experience of motherhood and the love and care I give to my children. But this feminine vision of the sacred must sure, surely also relate to the mystery of life grown and developed in darkness, the darkness of the womb, the pain of childbirth, the giving of self, the unconditional love through all of life's circumstances. For my daughter, that day it meant getting to understand that hers is a story that can be interwoven in our collective sacred story. I'm sure all of us have had particular experiences of coming across representations of the sacred, of the divine, maybe that have caused us to reflect and perhaps consider our sense of identity our belonging in Christian community, spirituality, and relationship with God. Does it matter whether all of us can recognize ourselves in our images of God? Might there be a need to, to redefine our images? And if so, in what ways? This evening, we've got two great panelists who will help us unpack some of these questions. And they will each speak for about 50 minutes and like usual, after each contribution, we will keep a moment of silence to receive and process what was shared. We hope that this will stimulate your thoughts and reflections. And we would be keen for you to share these with us through the chat, if you can. And then if you have a particular related question for any of the panelists, could you please post these through the Q&A function? Also, if a particular question has been asked that resonates with you, you can then upvote the question to help us in selecting which questions are most relevant to you. After the final reflection, we will move into a time of conversation between the panelists before then opening up the questions and response. We are hoping to finish the webinar at 9 p.m. Uh, you can engage on Twitter using the hashtag Global Voices. And also um, just to remind you that the webinar is recorded for later publication on YouTube. Uh, you can reach out to myself and uh, the team, uh, the tech team here through the chat if there's any issues. Um, last but not least, we are very grateful to all of you who have made a donation to help us keep running 
these webinars in the future. So let me now hand over to the Dean of Leicester Cathedral, the very Reverend David Monteith, who will introduce himself and our first panelist of the evening. Thank you, David. Thanks, Miriam. Lovely to be with uh, everybody this evening. I'm David Monteith, the Dean of Leicester, and uh, part of uh, the privilege of my uh, role at the moment is to steward something of the past and to try and help people interpret it uh, with responsibility and wisdom, but also cathedrals as places of um, art and beauty are also places that create new images as well. So both those things are important to me in the work that we do here at Leicester Cathedral. I'm mindful just as we gather this evening that we gather in the context of uh, a new war suddenly having started uh, as Russia invades Ukraine. And so we carry all of that with us this evening, those stark images, and recognize once more just the power of the image uh, on all of our lives. And those people and places will be in our background tonight. But also as we talk about this important subject, we recognize that it touches on deep things within us. And so as ever, I would encourage you to take good care of yourself and to on a webinar, if things are difficult for you in some way or other, then you know, do talk to somebody or uh, leave for a bit and come back again, but look after yourselves this evening. It's a real joy and privilege to uh, introduce our first speaker this evening, that's uh, Chinny, Chinny MacDonald. Um, her voice probably well known to a lot of people, at least if you listen to Radio 4. Uh, Chinny's read Theology at Cambridge, um, uh, but also has worked in a variety of Christian organizations, including uh, Christian Aid, the Evangelical Alliance, and now works as the director of the think tank Theos. Uh, this is Chinny's book, which um, some of you may already have read, and I thoroughly recommend it. And um, Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the uh, Anglican community in the States, says that in it, there's a word of warning, and yet it's a harbinger of hope. So welcome, Chinny, this evening, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, uh, David, and thank you, Miriam, for your um, really moving opening. I really related to um, what your daughter felt. Um, and it's linked to what I'm going to start uh, by saying, which is that the first time I encountered God in my likeness was when I was reading a book called The Shack. And while I wouldn't take all my theology from this book, um, like millions of others, I had been reading um, this book, the New York Times bestselling novel by Canadian author William P. Young. And it tells the story of a man who, torn apart by grief after an unspeakable tragedy, encounters God in three persons in a shack in the middle of nowhere. And God is represented by the Holy Spirit in the form of an Asian woman, Jesus in the form of a Middle Eastern man, and Papa, God the Father, in the form of a curvy black woman. And let me share um, an image now of um, the book. Um, so you'll see Octavia Spencer there, um, who plays God the Father, Papa, in the film. So I had been reading this book um, and those who had read the book were careful not to give spoilers. So when I encountered Papa in the pages of the book, I was left open mouthed because I'd never imagined God to be portrayed in this way. And I remember when I got to those pages, I called my mum who had read the book before me and we were on the phone, we were excited and we were overwhelmed, yet we were also, there were also moments of being speechless, of silence because God looked just like us. And when Octavia Spencer um, played God the Father in the film, she'd also played, uh, ironically, a maid, Minnie Jackson, in the civil rights film, The Help. It was amazing to see go her going from The Help to The Almighty. And seeing her on screen brought it home to me even more, because here she was, a beautiful, curvy black woman playing God. And it's hard to describe what this meant to us. It's not that I think God is a black woman, 
it wasn't something we'd ever called for or even consciously thought about. But there was something truly liberating in seeing, even for that short period, a God in whom we could really see ourselves. In those brief moments of revelation, I realised that it did matter to me what God looked like. It was more than just about preference and political correctness, but something that ran deep through the Christian story of incarnation and the Imago Dei. While I could kind of conceive of God as not being white after seeing this depiction, it had never occurred to me really that Jesus wasn't white. And by the time I woke up to this fact, it was far too late to reconfigure this image that I had of Jesus in my mind. And if I'm being honest, despite the books, <laughs> despite the book that I've written, despite the talks that I've done, when I picture Jesus, I think of a piercing blue, piercing blue eyed man with a brown beard and sandy neck length hair. He looks a little bit like Robert Powell did in the 1977 Jesus of Nazareth film. He doesn't look ordinary, but he definitely looks white. So that means that at times when I've pictured Christ on a cross, when I've cried out to him in my darkest moments, when I've prayed to him for those things that I've desired most, when I've sung praise to him in worship, I've pictured a man who never existed. The Jesus I have clung to most of my life is a falsehood, a symbol created by the effect of white supremacist fiction. God is not a white man. And this revelation is painful and brings with it a realisation that white supremacy has found its way into the most sacred place. Although it's painful, um, the realisation that Jesus was not white has also brought with it a profound sense of liberation. Freeing my mind from this idea of whiteness as synonymous with the divine. Most who have read the Bible um, or know any part of its history, whether they believe in Jesus or not, know that the incarnate God in human form would have looked like a man from what we have come to call the Middle East, born in Bethlehem. And as I'm sure many of you have, I've been fortunate enough to visit that wonderful holy place and meet its people, each a different shade of brown. But the, the Jesus that I picture, even to this day, looks nothing like them. White Jesus is the logical consequence of a world that values whiteness as supreme. The most famous artworks picturing Jesus from Salvador Dali, Christ of St. John of the Cross, to Holman Hunt's The Light of the World, to Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi, depict him as white with long hair and a beard. And this image is still the only one I have of Jesus, a consequence of having seen thousands of images of Christ represented in this way throughout my life. And unseeing and reimagining white Christ in the minds of believers is almost impossible. Because in a world where whiteness is power, then of course, an omnipotent, all-knowing God must be white, because God could be nothing else. I think that the um, image head of Christ might have something to do with um, this. So I'll just share this image just for a few moments um, with us. Hopefully you can. Let's see. What's... Um, this is the image head of Christ by Warner Salmon that was created in 1940. And this image will be very familiar to, to many of us. It depicts uh, an almost archetypal Christ. And it's Jesus, but with an extra dash of USA. And he looks a little bit like he could be in a 1990s Levi's advert. His blonde hair wavy, his perfectly shaped beard and his piercing blue eyes staring up at something in the distance. And there's this light of a lamp or candle illuminating the background. And this image has been described as the best known American artwork of the 20th 20th century and it's been reproduced more than a billion times worldwide. 
Salmon's head of Christ is, of course, not the only depiction of Jesus resembling a white European. In fact, this is the form that's become most recognisable to people across the globe, not just in uh, white majority Western contexts, for centuries. And this archetypal depiction of Jesus that we see today is thought to have originated in the fourth century during the Byzantine era, when the image of an enthroned emperor with long hair and beard came to be the predominant way of representing Jesus. And much later on, this evolved into the, the types of representations of Jesus we see today. But why does it matter? It can be easy for people to fall into the trap of thinking that white Jesus makes sense in a white majority context. But the problem is that images like the head of Christ are pervasive all throughout the world. The image can be found in Christian homes in places like Nigeria, where I'm from, or India or China, for example. White Jesus is the consequence of a number of Western historical, theological and sociological prejudices that were so fundamental to the notion of white superiority that Christ could not have been anything but white. And one of the main factors, argues theologian Sean Kelly, author of a book called Racializing Jesus, is that 18th century German theologians argued among themselves about the ideas that on one hand, Christ was ordinary, and on the other hand, he was completely otherworldly. So placed within this historical context of first century Palestine, Jesus could be seen as an essentially Jewish figure whose teachings were in line with those of other Jewish sages of the time. But those who wanted to downplay the ordinariness of Jesus and elevate his unique divinity, subsequently became more anti-Judaism in their descriptions and their depictions of Jesus. And some theologians sought then to offer various solutions that stood Jesus apart from his Palestinianness and his Jewishness. And this led to the idea that instead Jesus was in fact racially Aryan, so set apart from his Jewishness, his brownness, and his so-called ordinariness. So white Jesus became a way of emphasizing Christ's divinity as, as distinct from the brownness of his historical context. So images of Jesus became less and less Jewish and more and more white as Christianity spread from the Middle East to Europe. And it wasn't until I watched a documentary on the BBC when I was a teenager that I properly took notice of the fact that the representations of Christ so ingrained in my mind didn't reflect the historical reality of his probable appearance. In the program, anthropologist Richard Neve used a skull found in the region of Galilee to create a model of what Jesus might have looked like. And what they came up with was not beautiful by the Western standards that we have been conned into thinking are objectively so. Um, but since nowhere in scripture does it suggest that Jesus looked physically different from those around him, we can assume that he looked similar to the average Galilean man of his day. And, and Neve's reconstruction in the BBC documentary. But unseeing and reimagining white Christ in the minds of believers is almost impossible. In a world where whiteness is power, then of course, God had to be white. And there's just another dimension that I want to bring in, which is, um, uh, I guess, the um, some of the, the theologies around um, white evangelicalism in particular. Um, Robert P. Jones writes in a book called White Too Long that the emphasis on a personal relationship with Jesus that is front and centre in white evangelicalism only served to cement the depiction of Christ as white. Well, one of the main tenets of Protestant Christianity is this idea that we don't require a church, uh, a, a priest uh, as a mediator in order for us to have a relationship with God. Modern Western evangelicalism can at times give the impression that this relationship with Jesus is like one we might have with a brother or even a boyfriend. And as Jones puts it, whites simply couldn't conceive of owing their salvation to a representative of what they considered an inferior race. And a non-white Jesus would render impossible the intimate relationalism necessary for the evangelical paradigm to function. No proper white Christian would let a brown man come into their hearts or submit themselves to be a disciple of a swarthy sea mite. So where do we go from here? What does this mean for us 
in our churches and in our depictions of Jesus? What can we do practically? I think one obvious thing we can do is diversify the images of God and Christ we see in our churches. Um, I want to share with you um, just for a few moments at the end an image um, called A Last Supper by Lorna Mae Wadsworth, in which it depicts a black Christ. And images like this and many other similar types of images can help expand our view of God rather than limit our view of God by putting God in a narrowly defined box. Are diversifying our images enough? Clearly not. But I think we need to look at the people who are in our churches, look at who is leading and serving and contributing, and look at them to demonstrate the wonderful diversity of the kingdom of God. Expanding our view, not just of images, but of who God is, bigger and greater and more welcoming and more expansive than we could ever imagine. I'll end with sharing the image by Lorna May Wadsworth. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. Um, thank you. to remind you that you can put comments generally in the chat or if you've got questions that we want to um, consider a little bit later then put them in the Q&A. We're going to have a pause now uh, to reflect and the uh, little bit of liturgy is in the chat which I hope all of you can see. Do join in with this at home. Trusting that present with us and among us, let us turn to and call upon God, who is the giver and source of all wisdom. O God, take us from rich words into silence. Let us listen together for your wisdom. God, take us from silence back into words. Let us listen together for your wisdom. Thank you. We're going to hear uh, now from uh, Dr. Rennie Choi, uh, who uh, teaches and uh, is a tutor at St. Melitus Theological College in London. Um, has studied around the world and uh, Chinny went to Cambridge while uh, Rennie went to Oxford. So we have both of those universities represented here. Uh, Rennie's background is particularly focused on um, medieval studies and uh, particularly medieval Christianity, which of course, in terms of that discipline uh, is shaped very much by European imagination. But her work also then uh, thinks further about that in terms of uh, uh, post-colonial reading of that. And she examines uh, the meanings of what post-colonialism might, uh, uh, the ways in which it might be understood. And presently she's working with cathedrals and churches on some of those projects, particularly in relation to their art and images around their buildings. Archbishop Andrew Chow uh, from Hong Kong said that people uh, hailing from places peripheral to Europe, still find in that origins a spiritual base or land for their faith. So welcome to uh, Rennie this evening, who's going to help us reflect on this further. Thank you very much. David for that uh, wonderful introduction. And I'm very grateful for this chance to discuss an important question with you all. Uh, how do we respond to the church's inheritances that are tied to culture? 
that's really what this webinar tonight is about, isn't it? We can never capture the essence of God in our images of God. And so to bluntly answer the question posed by this webinar, from a strictly theological point of view, our images of God don't matter in any um, essential sort of way, because how we imagine God is always going to be an interweaving of our personal, confessional, ethnic, and cultural identities. We can't pick these apart and say that we can produce images of God that are immune from cultural influences. And this is precisely the problem we're faced with, what to do with religious inheritances that have been woven with cultural inheritances, some of these problematic. So I'll begin with observing that when many of us look at an image of God as a white man, something strange happens. Uh, Chine has used the example of Holman Hunt's Light of the World, so I'll talk about this painting too, specifically the version um, at St. Paul's Cathedral. I hope you can see that. Is that okay? Um, if it's not, um, please just uh, unmute and let me know. Um, Jesus here is a fair-skinned man with long blonde hair. And when we look at this painting, we recognize it instantaneously as a Christian subject. The title of the painting tells us Jesus is the light of the world. The Bible verse at the bottom explains Jesus is knocking at the door waiting for us to invite him in. It's an image that inspires a response of faith, of devotion. The painting leads us to prayer. And this is why St. Paul's Cathedral put this painting up as an altarpiece in a chapel, although currently it's been covered up due to refurbishment. And then abruptly, without warning, we notice the racial dimension. Jesus is blonde and white, and I am yellow with black hair. It's an intrusive, unwelcome moment. And it's not just race. It might be that we suddenly notice the depiction of masculinity or physical ability or the assumptions about beauty. In that split second, an image of God goes from being a devotional opportunity, something to help us pray, to being a problem, something that is alienating or makes us feel overlooked and uncomfortable. What has happened to make me start from a point of engagement of prayer and faith to disengagement, walking away and saying, this art is for certain people only. There is a historic explanation for our devotional instinct. Why at first an image of Jesus as a white man can inspire our faith. This very painting was taken on a tour through the British empire between 1905 and 1907 to show viewers around the empire about the glories of English art and religion. Crowds flocked to see it. The work inspired many copies throughout the British empire and was soon used by missionary organizations even outside of the British Empire. One of these was the Sunday School Union, which produced this evangelistic poster in China as a call to conversion using Holman Hunt's Light of the World. The imperial and global export of this image has created some dilemmas. For me, as someone born in British ruled Hong Kong, whose parents were Christianized under the influence of British missionaries, I can't deny that England is a spiritual homeland that explains the roots of my religious identity. Everything from the hymns I know to the sorts of phrases I use when I pray to the theological literature I read. And this means it's very difficult for me to see God through an East Asian aesthetic because Christianity has come down to me through the West owing to colonialism and globalization. And this is why decolonizing or diversifying our images of God, though vitally important and crucial, doesn't solve all of our problems. Like it or not, the fact is that for many of us, our religious roots do lie in the Western tradition. And to reject images of white Jesus means we'd have to reject most of what's in the National Gallery and the whole genre of gift books, which draw from the canon of Western art to inspire reflection and prayer. 
And to bring in newer, more diverse images of God is important, but it doesn't address the fundamental problem of what to do with our older images of God, which we have inherited historically. And this is why I think that now more than ever in contemporary battles about colonial legacies, it's crucial for us to engage with the church's cultural output, not to disengage. The problem is that the cultural output of Christianity is often associated with a privileged, established demographic. And calling pieces like Hunt's painting an English treasure, equating it with ethnicity and nationalism, is precisely the sort of thing which leads diasporic communities to say, well, this has nothing to do with us. And this applies more widely to all people who have felt that the high culture of the church isn't for them because of barriers having to do not only with race and ethnicity, but also with class or sexuality, gender, ability. It's much easier for us to ignore the church's cultural history and not engage. But this would be to surrender the church's history to the elite. Are marginalized people only good for diversity programs, for new initiatives, for producing new art of black or Asian Jesus? Are canonical works like Holman Hunt's painting to remain high culture reserved for the elite only? No, marginalized groups should have the confidence, authority and opportunity to be today's interpreters of the Western Christian tradition. The things we've inherited like paintings of white Jesus must be reinterpreted through the eyes of the marginalized to ensure global experiences change the way the image is seen and who is imagined viewing it and who gets to interpret its meaning and importance. What does it mean to reinterpret our images of white Jesus, which are so abundant and so celebrated, so monumental, so established in our religious inheritance? It means inserting our own histories into a master narrative that's long been dominated by the established class to assert that the story of Western Christian Christianity is our story too, to expand our collective memory of these pieces, to change official interpretations about what these paintings mean. This applies to children, women, ethnic minorities, diasporic people, gay men and women, disabled people, the trans community, people with health conditions, at, any group that's been bypassed in dominant histories has to write its own story into it. And this is what Willie Jennings has called fragment work. It's a deeply Christian calling because it has to do with recovery and redemption and renewal rather than outright rejection. I just want to mention here the Tea House, which is a support network for clergy of Chinese and Anglican heritage which is a very good example of fragment work, of attending both to our roots that relate to soil and blood, so our biology, our race, and to roots that have been constituted through belief and deliberate identification, so our Christian faith, our Anglican confession. And the Tea House Network helps a diasporic community talk about our disjointed, conflicted conditions in this case, helping people of Chinese heritage investigate their relationship to a Western Anglican heritage to actively explore how this community's history and experiences intersect with the story of the Church of England. Now, this leads me to the practice component of the webinar, which I've been asked to include in, uh, in my talk. Uh, right now, I'm leading a research project which invites people to actively engage with the Church of England's history as it is manifest in its buildings, monuments, and art. The aim is to expand our understanding of what these objects and places mean to a diverse body of people beyond only what collectors, conservators, historians, bishops, and other guardians of national heritage tell us. So as our practical activity, please would you go to this website if you can, and Luke is putting that link in the chat now, and click on the heritage feature of the month. You can skip the text. Um, I've already said most of this in my talk. And I'd like you all to respond to Holman Hunt's painting. And you can just scroll down to the box where you can comment anonymously. Uh, you can remain anonymous by leaving the boxes blank that ask for your name and email address. 
And I've asked some questions here about how you experience and interpret Holman Hunt's painting, which I would like everyone to fill out if you can, paying special attention to what it means to you in light of your personal traits and background. So think about who you are, your history, your family history, and respond to the work in this personal reflective way. Anything you say is useful for expanding the way we see this painting so that it takes into account the viewer perspective and not just its canon canonical status in English and Anglican culture. And now to close and to stress why we are doing this, verses like 2 Corinthians 3.18, which talks about the church collectively being transformed into the image of God from glory to glory, or Colossians 3.10, which talks about God's people being renewed according to the image of the creator. These verses tell us that even more important than our images of God is our collective transformation into his image. This means that when confronting a historically and culturally bound image of God, like Holman Hunt's, how we work through the dilemmas and tensions they raise as the people of God is actually a very crucial part of being transformed into his image. Historically and culturally bound images of God are part of the church's inheritance. And by working through these inheritances together with all their problems and dilemmas, we see each other better and expand our view of the image of God through expanding our view of one another. So I'll end here and um, leave it to the Dean to uh, decide how much time or whether there is any time to give you to respond. Thanks, Rennie, um, very much indeed. Uh, as we did before, we'll just have a little pause again to uh, reflect on what Rennie has said and we'll use the little liturgy to do it which you'll find in the chat still. Trusting that God is present with us and among us, let us turn to and call upon God, who is the giver and source of all wisdom. O God, take us from rich words into silence. Let us listen together for your wisdom. to take us from silence back into words. Let us listen together for your wisdom. So I'm now going to invite uh, Rennie and Ginny to uh, come back uh, on screen. And we're going to have a little uh, chat together, the three of us. Um, and as we do this, uh, as ever, if you want to put comments, feelings, thoughts, poems, images, whatever, into the chat. That's absolutely fine. Uh, and some people already have put some questions into the Q&A. Please continue to do that. And you can vote up the questions. In other words, you can kind of um, uh, help the group decide uh, where we'll really focus our attention. But just first of all, um, I, I'd be really interested uh, to hear from each of Chinny and uh, Rennie just uh, what, what was the standout thing that um, your opposite number said, which has made you um, think afresh about something this evening? And maybe if we start with Rennie, uh, uh, reflecting on what Chinny said. Um. Well, instinctively, I would say, uh, because this is the phrase I um, typed in um, at least two times, um, unseeing and reimagining is almost impossible in a world where whiteness is, is power. Um, and I guess that um, I very much agree with that. And I think we share um, that sense of, well, why, the, you know, this is, this is therefore the, um, 
post-colonial predicament, isn't it? Um, that you can't, um, it's, it's almost impossible to reimagine and unsee the images that have been so entrenched and so established and what I've called canonical really in our repertoire of art. Um, and um, so, you know, um, it's, it's, it's very um, difficult to think about what, how, how to unsee, what does that mean? How to reimagine? And um, what struck me is that we have different, um, there's, there's different ways of, of doing that, isn't there? Um, Chine has proposed diversifying images, which I also agree is very essential. And then um, what I try to bring into the, um, the, the discussion is what do you do with the existing images? How do you reimagine even those existing images? And, um, and how do you um, learn to see even those canonical images in entirely new ways, which I think is very experimental. Um, and there isn't a methodology for it um, that, I, that I know of quite yet. Great. And Chini, your reflections on Rene's talk? Yes, um, I feel like we could go in, off in lots of different directions, even just from, from those reflections. But I think what, I was what I've taken from um, Irene's book and and thinking about what what she said was this idea of um, yeah not rejecting necessarily those those white images but expanding and that idea of inserting our own histories into those places where um, uh, pe people who have been marginalised where where their group where their voices have been not heard and that includes race that includes gender that includes sexuality that includes um, the, the kind of uh, physical ability that all the broad spectrum of voices that have been excluded um, from these kind of canonical um, uh, works and that I did, I'd not heard of that um, Willie Jennings's idea about fragment work and um, before and how we um, how we do that and how we redeem those images um, and I think that that's a really interesting um concept because I, I guess there can be a danger in this kind of work that we're doing um, and in, in you know in me thinking and exploring some of these images is to see those uh, canonical images as inherently bad because they are white but still you know my favorite image of Jesus is Dali's Christ of St John of the Cross it's a stunning uh, piece of art so what actually um, does that mean I can never look at that piece of art again or actually what does what does a black woman uh first second generation nigerian british looking at that image um how can i interpret that in a new way and bring my own, own voice into that so yeah there's um lots of interesting stuff from what Rennie was saying around that expanding one of the things which struck me in listening to both of you was to note afresh the power of the image and um, and particularly, um, I mean, at one level, that's not surprising. But of course, at another level, um, you know, Christianity and Judaism has had a quite a convoluted relationship with image, um, and particularly with God and image. Um, and and yet, I think many of us continue to find roots to God and indeed obstacles to God through image. So I'm just wondering, uh, and particularly in a culture like ours, which is very powerfully shaped by image, you know, um, I still haven't quite mastered the mysteries of Instagram, but the rest of the world has. It's clearly important to people. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, kind of, are you saying that we need to pay more attention to image or are both of you saying th that image gets us into too deep of a problem really? So um, I'm an Instagrammer. I, 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 I think that images are powerful. Um, I think that, um, I guess there are two, two, two sides. So I think in Images have power, and how can we um, reimagine those images? Um, but I also think there's something inherent in Christianity itself 
that is about incarnation. So the kind of the invisible becoming visible, um, Jesus um, is God made into an image um, that we could see and touch. Um, the problem is when that image has been um, distorted in some, something that it, it was not in order to um, make out that whiteness was supreme. So that, that's where the problem is. I think there's on, on one hand, we need to, um, Christianity itself is, a, is, is about incarnation and image, and actually we should celebrate the beauty of that image, those images. However, on the other hand, there's a part of me that thinks when it comes to God rather than Jesus, there's something powerful in not imagining God or imaging God as a human or a, you know, a person like us or whether it's black, black or white, because to me, again, God, um, it makes God smaller, potentially. Um, so the point of Jesus was an incarnation, God in human form. Um, but I was struck a couple of years ago when I spoke at a primary school um, online and I asked them, what do you think God looks like? Um, and I thought they would say Father Christmas, um, but they said, um, it was like a year five class, and they said, I think God looks like a ball of energy, or I think God looks like a yin yang sign. And it completely blew my mind that these children <laughs> had kind of almost like a, a, a better understanding of the kind of a concept of God as not like a human uh, and potentially bigger and um, more mysterious. Um, so I think there's, there's two there's two sides for me. So, Annie, do you think that is image too much of a problem for us or should we go with the cultural instinct that image is a brilliant way of communicating? Um, yeah, what a great question. Um, I mean, it just from a strictly, you know, biblical um, point of view, um, you know, um, not to render graven images of God um, as, as, you know, as a commandment. Um, so in a way, um, because we're not, the emphasis is not on um, how we create an image of God or whether um, the image um, accurately captures who he is or um, a, an image as a sort of, um, well, at, at least from the perspective of um, Anglicans and um, um, traditional Protestant um, thought, um, images are not a sort of conduit um, to the divine um, as such. Um, but what the Bible is very clear on is that um, we are the image of God, right? And um, I think in the context of a lot of the passages, it's also, um, it, it, there's an like ecclesiological um, emphasis to that. So it's a collective we um, imaging God. So it, in that sense, I think the image images um, are crucial, but um, what is the image we're looking for? Is it a physical image? Is it um, an Instagrammable, um, you know, um, a cool hip um, sort of image um, that we that we want, um, or is it about what's happening? Um, what the image? Um, I guess the relationship between um, the the people who are viewing um, the image. I guess what I want to say is, in a way, we have to turn um, the question on its head. Um, so what are we doing right now, us, all of us, um, to be the image of God? Um, and I don't think it's in, you, you know, it's, it's about the appearance physically, but I would want to emphasize um, the ecclesiological dimension, the relationship that we cultivate with each other is the sort of image of God that's emphasized in scripture. So kind of the softer skills about listening to each other, developing love, respect, um, not silencing um, and not excluding, um, and absolutely being able to see um, um, the, the beauty in each person, the, res the, the value um, uh, of, of each individual and paying, uh, prioritizing the sort of communication we do with one another. That um, to me at least um, is, is, is the emphasis um, for what images are, what an image of God is. Thank you. And, and certainly I recognize um, 
in, in all of this. I, I remember when I was uh, sort of in my teens and as a young adult, there was a, a great concern and, and of course still is a great concern about you know, the strong emphasis on the language of God as father when so many people's experience of earthly fathers might have been abusive or harmful in some kind of a way. And so the need to uh, work then with other images, which are also scriptural. Um, so there's something about the diversity of images in scripture itself and the story of God in all its richness and, and, and diversity. And in the same way as I, you know, I think about um, like sunflowers, Van Gogh's sunflowers, and um, you can't really see a sunflower again in reality without, once you've seen Van Gogh's sunflowers they kind of it sits in your head so that even when you're seeing the one growing in your garden you're playing this sort of this dialogue between the two different sort of images and 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 asking yourself you know which is more beautiful which is more true which is more um, meaningful um, which is more painful and there's something about the array of images we can hold in our christian lives which if we can hold them and learn to hold them then somehow that kind of organic, lively sense of the spirit being at work within us as we relate to these, these things uh, suddenly becomes really quite rich. And it allows certain images to rise to the top of our own personal spiritualities and our own church's spiritualities and others to fall with all the intended dangers in that as well because of the power issues that Chinny in particular was mentioning. Listen, we three could talk about this all evening, but we better not, because we should allow other people's voices into this through their questions. And there was one question which already really um, drew my eye as somebody who lives and works in Leicester, which is about the Islamic traditions and its ban on images. Um, uh, Hannah said ban images of the Prophet Muhammad. Well, actually, in Islam, of course, all images of a living thing are banned. Um, and so she's asking, is the Islamic tradition to ban those really a desirable practice when considering the issues around representation and identity? Or can we find strength in the ability of communities to be able to create images that reflect and represent their identity? There's a sharp version of this question, isn't there? Renny, what do you think? Yeah, I've always considered um, images in the Christian tradition to be an expression of faith, of Christian faith. So um, it, it, we're not iconoclasts um, because we don't hold to the same belief of what the images are doing. So um, like I said before, um, we um, even in um, very um, sacramental traditions, there is um, there is a very strict um, um, kind of distinction drawn between you know um, the image as um, a way to inspire faith, as a way to um, be close to holiness, much like a relic would be, um, versus um, actually um, um, some kind of um, a, a, a the image as having been transformed into a divine substance itself. And so on that um, basis, um, within the Protestant tradition, we have never um, banned images because they are an expression of Christian faith. And so I think that allows for a lot of diversity of representation because people are um, imagining God in uh, their ways, which um, you know, um, are culturally and historically and personally bound, um, um, but all of it can be taken um, much like um, you know phrases we might use in prayer or songs we might compose for worship, um, and that's kind of been the function of images, um, at least within the um, the Protestant tradition. Okay, well, I'm going to take that on another step with Chinny and come specifically to this question of um, a white Jesus and whether or not that is intrinsically wrong. Uh, and there's a related question to this. Somebody's uh, talking about the fact that in Christianity, truth's important. Uh, Rosalind said this and therefore was asking, shouldn't any image of Jesus himself be as realistic as possible to his earthly image? without reinterpretation. 
So that those are kind of related things, aren't they? Chinny, I wonder if you'd respond. Yeah, just just firstly and briefly on on um, Islam's um, uh, ban, I guess of Im of images. I've often been asked this question, and I guess um, I it would be something to replicate if it let if it leads to an inclusive and a diverse faith. And I don't think that um, we see that example as a result of not having images um, of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, so I think, so I, I don't think necessarily that that is, that, that is the answer. And as Rennie said, it's it's kind of inherent almost in our Christian faith. It's an expression of our Christian faith. Um, white Jesus. Um, yes, I think um, either Jesus should be represented as um, a Middle Eastern uh, brown Jewish person. And that was um, that was who God chose. Uh uh, God could have chosen any kind of any race or nation in which to be born into. Um, but yeah, that was the one kind of historically and accurately that was chosen. So either we just have images of um, Middle Eastern Jesus, or we have a, a diversity, a full spectrum of um, images from different cultures that represent and symbolize the incarnation, God becoming like us. And what whoever that us is, so whether that's an us um, uh, in in China or a, a, an us in Nigeria or an us in Syria or wherever it is, um, I think the problem is that that's not what's happened. <laughs> and what's happened is in those places in Nigeria, um, in China, in Syria, the predominant images of Jesus are of, of someone who is other from from those communities. So what does that say about Christianity? It, it, it exacerbates this idea that Christianity is from another place. Um, God is from of those people and we're kind of being invited into a story, but God is not, uh, we are not part of that story. Um, so, uh, and often I hear people say, well, obviously we have white Jesus in the UK and in America because it's predominantly white, white nations and actually every culture represents Jesus in their own way. Um, and that's just not true. That's because of the pervasiveness of white supremacy globally. Um, and even if you go to some of those um, communities, if you go to kind of Nigerian homes where they've got this kind of, if they've got head of Christ um, in their living rooms, for some it would be um, the whiteness um, is, is important. <laughs> to them because whiteness in even in those contexts is seen as better um, and Englishness is seen as better and Europeanness is seen as better in, in a way that um, they're excluded um, from that story but they don't necessarily realize it or want to engage in those conversations. Yeah okay so I want to take this on a bit further and I go back to, to Reni because um, in a sense Chinese argument uh, focuses on the diversification of image, essentially, or not all of her arguments, but certainly one of her arguments. Um, and Rennie, your argument focuses more on the need for, if you like, reinterpreting or, or even perhaps redeeming some of those images. So um, Mark Nam, who's uh, on, the, on the call with us tonight, says, are all the images of white colonial Jesus possible to reinterpret and imagine for the diaspora positively, or are some beyond redemption? And related to that, somebody else is commenting about that. If, if, if the invitation is to reimagine and to redeem, does that put the burden of that uh, more heavily on those who've been adversely impacted by some of these images? So it picks up the power question. Yeah, the power question is a very um, interesting one and whose burden it falls on to reinterpret. I think that's an excellent um, point and really, um, um, uh, really well noted. Um, so I think that two things here, um, it's about whose uh, recognition and acknowledgement of who is part of this story of um, the Western Christian tradition and therefore, um, whose stories get to be told as part of this bigger story, this narrative of the Church of England or um, Anglican history or um, Western Christianity. And um, 
I think that there is um, a, the, the, so the burden of kind of um, inclusion and inviting responses and um, and um, quite deliberately um, countering historic exclusion, um, that burden does rest on those who have traditionally been um, established and um, well connected with these centers of cultural capital, which are cathedrals and abbeys and historic churches are, you know, this country is littered with them. Um, and so what I think is quite important to do is to disassociate our religious heritage with a kind of a national and ethnic label that this is, you know, some something, um, some glories of um, English cultural output or things like that, because it really fails to recognize just how many people have been touched by um, this as a, a legacy of un, um, an uneven relationship of power. Um, so the burden, you know, rests on th those who currently hold the power to say we are able to let go of some of our authoritative um, interpretations of what these um, um, pieces do in our cathedral, who they're for, who gets to say what they mean, um, where they're put, uh, what's the most important thing about them. Um, but then there's the question of um, you know, there are those of us who have been touched by Western Christian Christianity and um, who have not, I guess, been given a chance to say, these are our religious spaces too. And um, so these things make me uncomfortable. These things make me feel um, familiar. Um, these things make me feel secure and comfortable, but these things I find um, are quite, you know, um, exclusionary or marginalizing. So um, I think that there is, um, there is a bit of a burden on, uh, that's my own personal opinion, um, for us to be more upfront um, about, you know, our personal stories and how they intersect with um, Western Christianity. I know it's not, um, it's kind of not, we've now realized that it's not quite um, a polite question to see somebody like me or Chine and then to ask, where are you from? You know, so, um, so most people at least, I hope now know not to do that as the point of, you know, first contact, where are you from? You sound foreign or you look foreign. Um, but quite aside from that in initial kind of othering of um, people like us, um, I think there is, an opportunity now to actually in um, in, uh, um, an environment of comfort and security and respect to say, well, actually where, what is your family history and how does that affect how you engage with these spaces that are so historic and monumental? How, how should we learn from your perspective? Which leads me to um, Mark's question um, about, you know, are there some images that are beyond redemption? And I, really do think um, this is like maybe a cop-out answer, but um, it is all about the community, isn't it? And there's a different answer for every, diff every uh, each particular local community who's um, affected by an image in a different way or offended by an image um, in a different way. So, um, I, you know, I, I'm of the mentality that that negotiation together um, when done healthily is actually all part of the recovery process, even and the process of restoration and renewal, even if it leads to entirely different answers from one context to another. Jenny, do you agree? Um, is, it, is it very context laden? I mean, I, I've got in my mind the image of the Colston statue being pulled down in Bristol last year. I've got the image of the Archbishop of Canterbury commenting on the current court case at St John's Cambridge and being told he was a bit naughty doing that because uh, it's a court case still going on um, and so you know th this is real disputed territory isn't it and um, and society uh, the communities that make up society have quite different answers to the question. Yeah absolutely the, the Colson statue was um going through my mind as, as, as Renny was talking just then. And I wondered actually if, if the Colston statue was the image, um, in a way, the tearing down of the Colston, images of the tearing down of the Colston statue are the, have replaced the Colston statue. Yeah. So in a way it's, it, it's kind of done what Renny's asked, asking us to do, which is to engage and create therefore new images. So, um, 
for the people of Bristol, who the protesters, they were engaging and reacting to that artwork um, and the response was to pull it down. So that is a legitimate response um, or to engage or be angry about it is a legitimate response. Um, so I think, um, yes, uh, I'd agree. I'd agree with that. Um, and around, the, yeah, around the context as well being significant. Um, I guess also what I'm reflecting on is um, the appetite of the communities themselves to want to redeem those images or to create new images. Because if I think about, if I think about my grandmother, um, I don't think she would see any need to re-engage or, or reinterpret white images of Jesus because she would see no problem with that. So we can make assumptions that some communities want to create their own images. Um, and it can be patronizing to suggest, well, they don't really understand, um, they don't really understand the incarnation or um, these kind of complex ideas around kind of uh, internalized uh, colonization or all these kinds of things. Um, but that those are legitimate responses as well. And for my family, um, my great grandfather was an Anglican priest in Nigeria and um, he was ordained in 1940. And he and my great grandmother used to run a school for Christian wives. Um, and when Nigerian women, just before they were uh, going to get married, they would come and stay at the school to learn what it meant to be good Christian wives. But what that meant in effect was that they learned how to um, bake cakes, uh, how to drink tea, how to dress like English women, um, because Christianity was intertwined with Englishness and whiteness. And uh, it was all about kind of this, when you became a Christian um, in Nigeria at that time, you were walking away from your um, indigenous religions. Um, you were kind of, because they were seen as um, wrong. Um, so you're walking out of those, out of the kind of backwards um, cultures that you've been part of into this kind of almost like whiteness, uh, middle-classness, Anglicanism. Um, and now for me as the great granddaughter, that is profoundly problematic. <laughs> um, but there is something around um, countries like Nigeria who, uh, or kind of the Windrush generation who see English, English history as their history too. <laughs> um, and, and kind of, they don't necessarily see the problems that, that I might see. Um, specifically, uh, I want to uh, take us into the, um, deeper into the whiteness question. And particularly, um, v Pinto has um, asked about uh, particularly the contrast um, within our spiritual traditions between black and white, uh, the light and darkness, the day and night, and so on. Uh, it's used metaphorically, and the contrast symbolizes the moral dichotomy of good and evil. White often represented as God, angelic purity, morality, Black often being used to represent evil, the devil, nothingness or absence. Uh, she asks, how may we move away from using such unhelpful metaphors? Rene. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I'm... <laughs> There's a biggie. <laughs> That's a biggie because we're dealing with um, entrenched vocabulary, aren't we? Um, so I'm not sure i'm not quite sure how i would um undo uh, you know what, what is a way to actually overturn um such entrenched language and um you know even broader than light dark black white um you know it's it just even all the trouble we have with knowing how to actually um uh, with the terminology we use um to describe um you know, people of color, um, diaspora communities, UK, uh, ethnic minority, minority ethnic, uh, global heritage people. I mean, um, so really how to label things um, and describe things and get away from, and people, um, and get away from the associations. Um, I think it's a really um, big task, which I think personally is why I'm a big, um, 
uh, I'm very much in favor of having you know, transnational approaches um, and getting away from any sort of um, uh, boundary um, labels in the first place. Um, but I, I actually, I don't know the answer to that, I'm afraid. I think it is, yeah, it is obviously a really, really difficult one because the language is so entrenched and and we, we can chart back, you know, through history and through kind of literature, why certain kind of phrases or terms and colours were used kind of negatively and posit positively. But I think I even noticed in, in Miriam's opening where she talked about um, the darkness of the womb or something. Um, and, you know, in if you're talking about the kind of safety and the comfort for a, for a, for a child growing in its mother's womb and that dark darkness and that's a positive that's a positive way of using that word to me it's not a it's not a negative it's not a, a scary um darkness so there are it is possible to try to try and use language to alter perceptions uh, that feel entrenched but can be used in 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 different ways um, i think we have to um just try um, but i also think that sometimes things can go a little bit far when people talk about you know I don't know if this is real but you know the Daily Mail stories about people nurseries banning blah blah black sheep or things like that because because of the word black is is um is seen in a certain way so yeah I, I think we can sometimes go a bit too far and a bit too literal when it comes to kind of words around blackness and whiteness um but also we can be more creative um and not be stuck in the past when it comes to how we just use those descriptions and descriptors. I, I, uh, the question made me uh, uh, remember uh, an old friend, John Hull, Professor John Hull, who uh, uh, has died, but he, he did a lot of work on um, being a Christian and being a person who became blind in his adult life. And uh, similarly, looking at that, uh, so much of that imagery about you know blindness being moral blindness and um, the inability to receive God's gifts and all of that. So, but of course, he also uh, he very helpfully pointed out that verse from Psalms that um, uh, in God, light and dark are both alike to these uh, sort of thing. So, that, so even some of the our human experiences. To, to mine the scriptures for actually images that that address us in new ways, which we ha haven't maybe been giving such attention. I mean, uh, you, Chinny, you mentioned the Miriam's use of the of the womb womb imagery, and of course th that is there in, in different parts of scripture and so on. And and so maybe there are are clues to redemption of some of these things even within the existing Christian tradition, um, but our hermeneutics have become very clouded by our own much narrower experience, perhaps. Um, and, and somebody was asking um, uh, this whole business about how good is it to have God actually imaged as ourselves anyway? Um, uh, because isn't, isn't the point of God that God is completely other than us? Uh, that's a really profound question to, to ask, um, uh, but it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because God is also made clear to us in a person who did have a history and a skin color and a face and, and all the rest of it. So what, what, do, what do you think about that? How helpful is it in the end for us to image God looking like us? Rennie. Yeah, I guess I would go back to, um, you know, the entire enterprise of theological studies. It, 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 we, we could ask, you know, how, um, you know, our systematic doctrines and um, our, um, the beliefs that we articulate about who God is, um, that all of that is actually um, an outworking of our questions, of our existential questions, human um, questions about who we are, our mortality, um, what we strive for, what is good, what is moral, what is truth, um, 
you, you know, what is this that's around us and what do we aim for in life and how do we relate to each other? You know, all these kinds of questions that are actually driven um, from the only language we know, which is um, our, our human language and our human experiences. So our language of God will always be conditioned and restricted in a way by our humanity, right? And that's just, um, that's kind of the number one thing that we acknowledge when we start out with um, any theological study, um, that it's a reflective practice at the same time. So I think in the same way, uh, visual images of God work in much the same manner. Um, so that it's an attempt to work out what it is that we believe. And so that means that in visual art and depictions, you might emphasize different things. You know, some people may emphasize transcendence, some people may emphasize judgment, some people, some artists may emphasize um, fear or, you know, um, death, um, sacrifice, you know, um, loss, and then others may emphasize victory and triumph and glory and, um, and or charity, love, relationship. I mean, these are all ways that we have, that this explains the diversity of the images we have of divinity and of the Godhead. And um, so therefore it is really a, a kind of a record of how humans have tried to um, understand and articulate God and to work out some very fundamental questions, um, you, you know, um, about how humans have been, I, I mean, I think um, going from what Chine has said as well, where we are in history now, um, I think some of our images of God, you know, where we need to push it and where, you know, what, what kind of questions do they express about human existence today? Um, we need to think more about these um, questions about how we've hurt one another and how we've been um, damaged by one another. And so, um, you know, Chagall's um, White Crucifix comes to mind where this is, a, this is a, an attempt to kind of um, grapple with divinity in a way that acknowledges and admits human error and human wrong. So he, you know, is trying to depict um, atrocities that have been committed um, toward Jews um, as a background, a backdrop to the crucifix. And I think that, you know, working out what human existence means in this space, in this time, in 2022, amidst a war um, and, and the conflicts that are happening right now and today that are shocking and um, horrifying, um, you know, this, this is all part of what the theological enterprise is. Jenny, any additional comments from you on that? Um, I think I keep, you know, going back to that moment in which I saw, uh, in which I read The Shack, um, and that moment in which I, for the first time, saw or read about a God that looked like me. Now, I had heard all my life that I was made in the image of God. Um, I had heard all my life around the incarnation about God becoming like us, but it wasn't until that moment where I actually felt that in somewhere in my kind of inner being and there's something profound about that now I realize that um I have been able to read a, a you know a New York Times best-selling book where God looks like me but I've never seen an image of God um in a wheelchair uh, I've never seen a image <laughs> of God uh uh in in lots of different ways that are not kind of me so it's not just about race um I think being able to see images of God in which you can see yourself in some way, um, go to the heart of what it is to understand what the Christian faith is about, which for me is around God becoming like us and about incarnation. Um, and I know I keep saying it, but I think that 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 is the whole point. It's not just about political correctness. Um, and it's not just about diversity and inclusion. It's about what is what is this faith that we profess? What what is it that we believe? Um, and if we believe that it's okay um, for um, um, white men to be able to predominantly see God as looking like themselves, um, uh, then that to me means God is smaller um, and more limited and, and not as open-armed as uh, the God that we read about um, in the Bible. Thank you. That fits really well with, um, uh, I think, three people uh, have been... Um, um, wondering about um, the nature of the representation of the sacred 
which is also about human embodiment. And so, um, and you've already touched on this, Chinny, what, what's our views on the need for sacred imagery to intentionally attend to the inclusion of marginalized expressions of human embodiment? So Chinny, you mentioned that in terms of disability. Um, uh, Rennie, I wonder other, how do you respond to that? Is, is this, is this, a, is this a, a task for the church? Yeah, so um, hmm. embodiment. Yes, I mean, I think that there is a, a, um, a there's a strong push today to um, to ensure that um, what we put in our churches um, uh, are um, um, represent community and are participatory in nature. So that, you know, that um, they kind of break the link um, that we have um, between um, um, maleness and, um, um, and ethnicity, and whiteness um, with, with um, what's visible, you know, um, so who gets heard and what gets seen. And so um, that is a form of trying to um, render in you know, material form um, all the diversity of people as well. Um, so participation um, as a way to um, make sure to 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 um, to fully render visible all the people who make up a community, um, and and uh, so I think that's my kind of basic answer to this question of embodiment. Um, it comes in different shapes, it comes in different forms, and it's up to um, you know um, the community um, to to express what what way of embodying means the most to them, in what shape, in what form, um, in what sounds, in what kind of, um, what senses <laughs> um, mean the most to certain people, you know, is this about just, um, um, you know, some, some church spaces you go into are very gray or white and monotone, um, is this about enlivening our um, the, the, um, our sense of sight with more color is that a, a, you know is that a way to embody um to toward greater embodiment um is it about sounds you know is it about um touch and sensorial experiences i know um some you know cathedrals um have i uh, so <laughs> i think that there's a lot to learn for example from um education departments um, and learning departments in kind of heritage spaces that work with children because children are very physical, tactile um, beings. And so the tangible and the material and the embodied experience is especially important to children. And so her um, learning officers have wonderful creative ideas about how to engage the senses and for example, lie down and look at um, ceiling mosaics at St. Paul's Cathedral is one, you know, one way to, em em to to um, be physical in a space and to be seen. Um, uh, it's, that's all part of kind of embodiment. Jenny, I'm just conscious that, that um, for many years, um, the church community um, didn't look to the artistic community very much to kind of, uh, we, we got out of the habit of kind of commissioning new pieces of art and, and that sort of thing. A, a bit more has happened recently. But I just wonder, you know, even in thinking about that uh, business of trying to diversify the images and getting more embodied images, isn't there something also about the way power is at work and privilege is at work, even within all that artistic society? It's not just within the church, but there's another community where white privilege is, is very much known and felt. So it's quite a complex thing, this. Yeah, it is, it is extremely complex. You know, when we come to conversations like this, we think we're, we're just talking about, you know, we need to have more diverse images of God and Jesus. Um, but um, even if we look back to, you could say that the reason why the predominant images that we have of Jesus are of 
a white European is because of um, the, the success of um, Renaissance art and the fact that actually European artists were would would paint Jesus as you know self portraits almost. Um, so that's the reason why so many of those images um, were people who 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 looked who looked Italian uh, European. They were the people who had the money to be able to be artists. Uh, they had access to, um, you know, the right people in society to be able to make their artwork kind of visible and famous. So you, it's right that actually we're still, this conversation is almost um, quite middle class <laughs> in, in that it is around art um, and some of those images. So actually, we also need to think about class uh, and I know that Rennie talks about this as well um, uh, in that actually what does what are different types of art um, what what does art mean to um, people who are not in churches who don't go to cathedrals who are just kind of average people in the UK and how can we uh, in, engage um, them I think I was at um, a, a launch last week at St Paul's Cathedral um, of a new kind of uh, uh, work that they're doing uh, 50 new images there was a, a Nigerian artist who had created this amazing uh, new image that was marking 125 years since the uh, uh, sacking of Benin City and that is doing exactly what we have been talking about which is kind of reinterpreting uh, a, a hist history um, through the eyes of someone who is Nigerian so someone who was on the receiving end of something that kind of um, was celebrated in, in, in the UK. And I found that a profoundly moving event because I was surrounded by Nigerian people like me. Normally, I'm at St Paul's Cathedral a lot. Normally I don't see a lot of Nigerians there, um, but it was still kind of middle-class Nigerians or, or people who engage in artworks and who can get invited to those things. So we need to kind of broaden um, the conversation and invite new voices, new people in. Thank you. Um... I think I need to be a very good uh, moderator at this moment and, and do what I'm supposed to do, which is hand back to, to Miriam, who's going to um, help draw our evening to a close because it's very nearly nine o'clock. Miriam. Thank you, David, and thank you so much, Chine and Rennie. Um, it's been great listening to the conversation and also the engagement uh, of the audience in the chat and the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us this evening. I really hope, we hope it was a helpful space for you and has inspired you to explore new perspectives and voices as you expand your knowledge and experience of who God is. I'd like to actually finish with a, a quote by Cole Arthur Riley, who's also known as the Black Liturgist. Um, she just published a book, uh, it came out today, it's called This Hair Flesh. And she writes, some theologies say it is not an individual, but a collective people who bear the image of God. I quite like this because it means we need a diversity of people to reflect God more fully. Anything less and the image becomes pixelated and grainy, still beautiful, but lacking clarity. If God is really three parts in one, like they say, it means that God's wholeness is in a multitude. Thank you to our panelists, Chine and Reni, our moderator David and our tech team. We are keen to improve what we offer, so we would be grateful to receive your feedback on this webinar. A link to a brief survey is posted in the chat. Uh, also keep an eye on Diamil and Leicester Cathedral Eventbrite to find out the date of our next Global Voices webinar. It will most likely be in October, the 12th of October, but this will be confirmed. Thank you everyone and uh, see you very soon. Just before everybody goes, can I just say a huge thank you to Miriam? Because um, although we'll probably, I would imagine we might well see Miriam and another one of these things as a participant. Um, she moves on from our life here at Leicester Cathedral at the end of March and also her work within the Diocese of Leicester um, moves down to London um, where she'll be uh, up to all 
this kind of stuff down there as well, we hope very much. But all of these conversations wouldn't have happened without Miriam's imagination, theological wisdom and great planning and organisation. So I want to say on behalf of us all, a huge thank you to Miriam for having got all of these up and running and established something really important that we very much want to keep going and take on into the future. Thank you very much, Miriam. Thank you, David.